This, my friends, is what fantasy is all about. This is why I got on board with this genre. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. On May 14, I started reading the final book in The Wheel of Time. That is one year and four months after I started reading the first book in this series, which in my case was New Spring, the sequel to The Eye of the World. This, A Memory of Light, is a very important book for me. And because of that, I want to give it extra attention. This is not my usual reading experience, but a little bit more extensive than that. I've made a reading vlog of this important read. Six times I randomly started talking into the camera. I'm not very good at improvising because I easily get stuck in the English, knowing what I want to say, but unable to come up with the right words for it. Nevertheless, I will show you the most interesting parts of these video entries. I've decided to make this a spoiler-filled video. So if you haven't finished reading this epic series, I would advise you to not watch this video at this point. There will be major spoilers, and it would be a shame if that would ruin your reading experience. In this graph, you can see the progress of my reading sessions. I really took my time with it, as you can see, mainly because I really wanted to savor every page. Here are some snippets of my first entry on May 14. I think it's time to finish reading this series. So today I'm going to make a start with reading A Memory of Light, book number 14 and the final book in this epic, epic fantasy series. This is such an important book. It's the book that closes off the very first fantasy series of this epic proportion that I've ever read. It's still looking very pristine, but I tend to crack spines, so this will become a battered book by the end of this video. I've got no idea how long it will take me. It's, whoa, almost a thousand pages, more than a thousand pages. I know now already that this is going to be a very important read for me this year. I've been postponing this read for some time now because I don't want to say goodbye to the series. But I can't keep postponing this forever. It's been a normal working day for me, but at the moment it's past 9.30 in the evening uh, because I had to make a new video. Well, didn't have to, but I really wanted to make a new video. And I started editing it, and once I start editing, I completely forget time. So that's why it's pretty late in the evening. And now I want to continue my read of A Memory of Light, which I started yesterday. Yesterday I was very, very tired, so I didn't read very much. I got, I got to page 38, which is not very much, so I can't say anything about it yet, really. Uh, it took me about 15 or 20 pages to get into the story. And the only thing I do want to say at this point is that perhaps I may have waited too long uh, to pick this one up after Towers of Midnight, the previous volume in the series, because at times I really had to think very, very hard about what was going on. For instance, uh, this, the scene with Avienda, when she's telling uh, the other wise, wise ones about her experiences in the city of, what's it called? I'm so bad at names. In the city of Ruidian, or however you want to pronounce it. I really had to think, well, what happened there again? What was it that she experienced? She, she had some visions. And then reading on in the scene, it slowly came back to me. So I may have waited too long. About having waited too long in between books, it didn't take me very long to get into this book and almost automatically the scenes of previous books came back to life in my memory as well. A beautiful metaphor about someone's appearance. His features, framed by long dark hair, looked unfinished. 
chiselled from rock by a sculptor who had lost interest in the project partway through. It is May 19, and I just want to give you a quick update on where I stand. At the moment, I'm at page 198. Yesterday, I had a very, very good reading session. Before that, I had a, few, a couple of reading sessions which were a bit, uh, should I say, bumpy or, or difficult or slow. Somehow, I couldn't get into the book. I read every time about 30 or 25 pages, and then I had to put it down, partly because I was very tired and other part because I really couldn't get into the book yet. I loved it. I loved it. I love coming back and especially the beginning of chapter one. You know what I'm talking about. It's the paragraph which always starts the same. The wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, etc. And every time I read this, I discover new things. This time it was the sentence, there are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time. Somehow it, it spoke to me even deeper than it did all the other times I read this sentence. The more often you read it, the more meaning it gets. I loved the chapters about Talmanus in the prologue. They were impactful, very impactful, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So yesterday, finally, I started reading. I'm, I'm writing down, don't know if you can see this in the camera. I'm writing down the dates of what I, uh, of when I'm starting and how much I've read. So yesterday I started at 104 and finished reluctantly at 198. This is the sequence where all the leaders of the world come together uh, by invitation of Rand and they are discussing what they need to do. Where Rand, well, actually just says, well, these are the three demands I have for you and in return I will die for you. But uh, as always with Rand, he's not very diplomatic with it. Rand, Rand. He's not very diplomatic with it. And then the return of the character that we have been missing very long, Moiraine. She finally shows up, impeccable timing. It says somewhere in the lines, impeccable timing. Because the meeting was slightly, was going slightly out of hand and especially Egwene and Rand couldn't find any common ground on whether or not to break the seals of the Dark One. And both of them almost threatened to walk out on the meeting because they couldn't find common ground, as I said. And then Moraine shows up and she has always been the advisor. She has always been the wise one. She is the one who has dedicated her entire life in finding the dragon reborn and guiding him to the last battle. So that's what she is. And she is perfect. She is perfect. This, these two chapters, the, the chapter to require a boon and the chapter a knack, both chapters, I, oh, well, I actually wanted to underline every sentence in the book because it is so profound, it is so beautiful, and with every page, it, it gets better. But Moraine shows her wisdom again. She is so wise, and she knows exactly what is going to happen. She knows the prophecies better than anyone, and they listen to her. She has got authority. So things finally come to a, a good end. All the leaders of the world sign the document, the, the adjusted document Rand had drafted, and uh, they're going to work together. If Rand cannot get the Shan Shan behind this whole plan, then the whole document becomes void. It, it, it's meaningless. This, my friends, is what fantasy is all about. This is why I got on board with this genre. If I can find the time the next week, well, I'll probably make very, very good progress. 
This is 200 pages, this is one fifth, one fifth of the book because it's a thousand pages in my edition. When Perrin ponders on all that has happened to them, Rand says, the wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Perrin. We've become what we need it to become. This first line never gets old to me. It is essentially why I've grown to love these books. This whole concept of how everything that happens is supposed to happen that way, otherwise it would have happened differently. That to me is one of the most profound lessons in life and it is one that is a major step towards acceptance of all that happens. A few pages later, Rand repeats this message, but now with the weight of 14 huge books behind it. It will be as the wheel wills. The prophecies have nearly all been fulfilled. This day was seen, and our tests are known. We do not walk into them unaware. Time for the next update. It is May 21st and I'm at page 370 in A Memory of Light, the final book in The Wheel of Time. And I am so very much enjoying myself with this book. Since my last update, I find that the pace has slowed a little. There's a very big amount of uh, battle scenes, armies of humans uh, fighting the shadow spawn mainly Trollocs or Myrdral, Myrdal, and there's a very huge amount of that in this book, and it's unavoidable, I guess. I mean, this is what the whole story was working to, uh, all these books, toward the final battle, and so far, the final battle is, well, sort of already taking place, I would say, uh, but I believe that the real last battle will be at Shyogul, where Rand will meet with the Dark Lord and see how that goes. I don't want to uh, risk making any predictions about how that goes. First off, he really, really is determined to kill the Dark Lord. And Moraine says, well, you cannot kill the Dark Lord. That's impossible. By the way, the Moiraine chapters are my absolute favorites here. Let me see, I made some notes. Moiraine says, the Dark One is beyond killing. And still Rand persists and says, I think I can do it. Not knowing how, but he just thinks he can. And then Moiraine emphasizes, well, he's part of the wheel. And Rand doesn't agree. He says, no, the Dark One is outside the pattern, not part of the wheel at all. And then Moiraine says again, of course the Dark One is part of the wheel, Rand. We are the threads that make up the pattern's substance, and the Dark One affects us. You cannot kill him. It's a fool's task. I love, I love this. I love these references to the wheel, the wheel of time, and they are my absolute favorite parts in this book and the whole series for that matter. That's where the, the philosophy comes forward and takes first seat. I love it, I love it, I love it. Also what I absolutely loved was the return of the Ogier with Loyal and his family. Loyal is married by now. And, well, he says, well, it's not too bad at all. It's not very, not as bad as I anticipated. Very funny. And they join the battles. And one of the battles, uh, we already see the Ogier in action against the Trollocs. And they really massacre the Trollocs. For such a peaceful race, that is quite um, unexpected. They're skilled, they're very skilled, but they're also very, very, that their deepest aggression services somehow. It's just great. Oh yes, the final scene I just read, the final scene where Rand visited, visits Tuan and Matt, he is there as well. He spends his first night with his bride, who's the Empress of the Shanshan, by the way, and Rand 
comes to offer her peace and his arguments are so strong he claims well he's Louis Thurin. Louis Thurin was the ruler of of the world long before Arthur Harquing and Arthur Harquing is said to be and Tuan says that she descends from Arthur Harquing so she has claims to the land and Rand says no you don't I've got older claims and they prevail or something like that but the language used there is so strong <laughs> and it's funny because when Rand starts singing he is he's shielded by the Damani and when Rand starts singing the grass turns green and the peach tr tree starts to blossom start to blossom and everything <laughs> and then <laughs> Matt notices that he's saying, are you singing? He's whispering, whispering. And then he says, I swear I've heard that tune somewhere. And he starts tapping his feet. It's too made at the water's edge, isn't it? And then Rand whispers, you're not helping, Matt. You're not helping. Quiet. First of all, Rand says, I allowed you to live when I could have destroyed you in an instant. And then he says, your rule is as flimsy as paper. You hold this land together only through the strength and steel and Damani, but your homeland burns. I have not come here to destroy you. I come to you now to offer you peace, Empress. I have come because I believe that you need me as I need you. This is such strong language. I love it. So, what more can I say? When I was doing my, my previous update, I thought this is going to be Book of the Year, no doubt. But because of the, the, the it's, it's a little bit slow. The, the, the pieces are put into place for the final end game. That's how it feels these last hundred pages. Even though everything I read is beautiful and I'm, I'm, I'm completely over my, every five minutes I have, I pick up this book because it is, I'm drawn to it like a magnet. But I wonder, well, we'll see, we'll see. We'll just continue with this book. The skill of Brandon Sanderson. Very skillfully, he makes sentences that remind the reader of something that happened. Like, for instance, when Rand is having a conversation with Elaine and then somewhere just, just during the conversation, it reminded him of their time in Tear, stealing hidden kisses in the stone between sessions of political training, Rand had fallen in love with her during those days. Real love, not the admiration of a boy falling off a wall looking at a princess. These, especially this last sentence, it's such such a, a it's almost sneaky. No, sneaky is not the word. Let's, let's leave it at skillful. A very skillful way to remind the reader that what we are reading on this page has a very, very long history and so much has happened and the characters have gone through so much and that's the feeling these kind of small sentences evoke, at least with me, like, oh yes, yes, we, we've been there. That, that was the, his first meeting with Elaine when he fell off the wall in Camlin. I'm just in awe of Brandon Sanderson's skill. Shortly after the reappearance of the Ogier, Loyal is surprised when one of the elders says that she had argued against a certain cause of action, even though she was in favour of that action. An argument must have opposition, if it is to prove itself, my son. One who argues truly learns the depths of his commitment through adversity. Did you not learn that trees grow roots most strongly when winds blow through them. It is May 26 and it's very high time for an update. I am today at page 600 of this enormous book. I have a few things to say, apart from that I'm loving it. I'm loving it. At the beginning I thought it might become my book of the year, but at the point at which I'm right now I don't think it will be, no. Not that I don't like it, that's not at all what I'm trying to say, because I love it, but there are some issues here. One of them being the overdose 
on war and battle and blood and slaughtering and everything and war tactics it's a bit overdosed for me for this reader as i mentioned earlier it's almost inevitable that a lot of this book deals with war i mean that's i mentioned this earlier that's where this whole series is working towards the final battle still it's a bit too much so what i did in an attempt to not be overwhelmed with it and start to be a little bit disappointed i did pick up the light fantastic what i'm trying to say is this is the perfect counterbalance for a memory of light but this is the main attraction of course for this video i love the way matt really just slips into his role of Prince of the Ravens and becomes one of the great leaders of the armies. He's second in command um, until the end of where I am now, 600, page 600. And Egwene and the others realize that he's the only one who can lead their armies against the shadow. Why is that? Because the great generals, all the people we believed to be loyal to their bones, like Daphram Bashir, Gareth Brine, Ituraldi, and some others. Those were the most loyal people in their army we could imagine, and they make wrong decisions, working for the shadow, it seems. That's one of the most great moments in reading when Perrin finds out that one of the Forsaken, Grandel, she is the one going in and out of the dream world to the real world and manipulating the generals. Compulsion, it is called. And we've seen compulsion before. It, everything falls together. Everything comes together. It is so ingeniously plotted that Matt, who, first of all, seems to have the memories of a very ancient war leader and he is gifted with well not not a hatred but let's call it suspicion of Aes Sedai which made him wear one of the Angriels or Terangriels the medallion on his neck which makes him immune to the weaves of the Aes Sedai the one power when it's wielded against him so the forsaken Grandel is not able to use compulsion on Matt. It's, it's ingeniously plotted. I enjoy it very, very much, in case you hadn't noticed yet. The scene that impressed me the most is the meeting between Tuon and Egwene. Knowing what we know, what Egwene went through in previous editions of the book, being made, turned into a Damani and escaping it, this dialogue between the Empress of the Shan Shan and her is the best. <laughs> there is so much behind every word in this dialogue. It's amazing. This is such a strong scene where these two women with completely opposite views on women who can wield the power, the one power. At the end, for Tuona, who is Tuon, of course, says, I will break you myself. Someday your people will turn you over to me. You will forget yourself and your arrogance will lead you to our borders. I will be waiting. To which Egwene says, I plan to live centuries. I will watch your empire crumble for Tuona. I will watch it with joy. So they come to this point at the end of their dialogue where they wish each other the worst. Matt jumps in and he says, let's be civil ladies. Don't make me throw the pad of you over my knee. That's Matt. That's the role of Matt. This is by far the best scene until now. Well, perhaps the reappearance of Moiraine. That's hard to beat, of course. But this is so strong. When Egwene has left and Tuan says to Matt, we will have many words about this tonight. <laughs> and Matt says, I love words. There are some delicious pretty words out there. Smile. That's always sounded like a pretty word to me, don't you think? Or perhaps the words, 
I promise not to kill Egwene right now for trying to touch me, the Empress. May I live forever, because we really bloody need her for the next couple of weeks or so. It's funny, it's profound, it's intricate. I love it. I just love it. The longest chapter is about 70 pages away, the last battle. But perhaps in between I'll, I'll pick up this one, just for balance. Today, my friends, is a very special day. It's June the 1st, and I just finished reading Memory of Light, the final book in the Wheel of Time series. There is too much I want to say about this to be put into one vlog entry. The last time I spoke to you, I was uh, about 60 pages before starting The Last Battle, and that's a chapter. Let me just look it up for you. The last battle starts at page 676 and goes on until page 893. So that's more than 200 pages of battle. Now, I've mentioned earlier that I find the dosage of battle in this book way too much. Also, I've mentioned earlier on that it's probably inevitable because the whole series works up to this. The Last Battle, I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Still, even though the dosage is not perfect for me, to put it mildly, I loved this huge chapter in this book. More than 200 pages, the entire sequence. Hang on. I just grabbed this book, The Wheel of Time Companion, which has been literally my companion during my read of this huge series. And what is so beautiful about this book, it shows us the last battle in detail with maps and the progress of the entire battle. Don't know if you can see it like this, but it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages in which they tell the sequence which you have to be very careful with because it's completely spoiler filled. So you shouldn't be reading this before you start reading the final chapter. That will really spoil things because I'm going to spoil now. Somewhere it simply says Egwene dies. Anyway, this was a, a very useful guide for me while reading The Last Battle. Apart from all the movements with all the uh, army elements, you have the Shan Shan, you have uh, Egwene, you have Elaine, you have you have so many different army parts, parts of the army. But it's interesting. It's nice, and you can really follow the entire sequence. But most interesting, of course, is what Rand is doing during this entire battle. Rand is confronting the Dark One and he is going, well, in sort of a dialogue with the, the Dark One. Both try to impress the other with threads of the Wheel of Time that could have been or maybe. And that's very interesting. I've been reading literary fiction and literary non-fiction for the most part of my life. This series turned me from a reader of literary fiction into a reader of fantasy. And I have to say, I'm not disappointed at all. There is too much to say. I mean, if you just look at the pages with my underlinings, I'll, I'll show some of them. And 90% of those underlinings or notes are positive or just to remind myself where I can find a certain sequence. And, well, about 10% of them are not that positive. I so badly wanted this to be in my book of the year, but it's not going to be in my book of the year. I'm sorry to say it's very, very good. I'm thankful for Brandon Sanderson for finishing this series and for finishing it the way he did. Of the three final books in which Brandon Sanderson was involved, I prefer The Gathering Storm, the first one. That's where the pace picks up. Towers of Midnight, 
excellent, just an excellent book. Just a minor step down from The Gathering Storm for me. And this one, well, of course, it wraps things up. And the whole sequence with Rand and the Dark One is very intriguing. And somehow still I have the feeling that not everything was said that could have been said there. Because that's, that's the whole thing that intrigued me the most of the, the Wheel of Time series. The weaving of the threads through the Wheel of Time, the pattern it weaves. That's, that's philosophically so profound. That's my main interest in this series, really. And to think that I'm willing to read 15 books about this size, well, not all of them are this size, of course, but most of them are chunkers, means something. That means that I highly value the philosophical part of this series. By the way, as I mentioned, I'm a spine cracker, and I did crack this spine. For me, finishing this series is some sort of closing of an era. It really is. Uh, I mean, being a reader of literary fiction for all my life, and now being a reader of fantasy, and this is my first huge series, so I'm a little bit proud. There is so much more to say about this book, but this will have to do. It is not the best book I've read this year, and it is not the best book of this series as well, but it's a very important book. I've already mentioned the issues I have with A Memory of Light, as well as my appreciation for it. The ending left me a little bit unfulfilled, but that is due to my mountain-high expectations. Still, this remains one of the best books in the series. I gave it 93 points out of 100. On to the next huge series. Which one that will be? I really cannot say at this point. I first want to read some shorter series and perhaps a few standalones before I will start with Malazan, Wars of Light and Shadow, Stormlight Archive, or one of the other huge series. We will see. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard. <music>